so good to see all of you. Uh, title of the message for today, if you could just look at the title, uh, it's a little bit long. Restoring a brother in a spirit of gentleness. I'm going to I'm going to read it one more time. Restoring a brother in a spirit of gentleness. Can I see some exciting faces? <laughs> Are you excited to be in the presence of God? And I really do mean this question. And if you are, would you, would you mind saying amen? amen? I hope you are. And I really do, actually. Okay? Christianity is about God coming to us, coming into history, to seek and save the lost. Now think about that. Christianity is about God actually coming to us into history to seek and save what was lost. And Jesus did that. That's, that's who Jesus is. And I just ask you, who's doing that now? Who does that now? Seek and save what was lost. You are. Christians are. Churches. If you are living as a Christian, led by the Spirit. That's what we're going to be talking about today. You know, Christian gospel is about saving and delivering a person who is lost. Lost. Do you know anybody who's lost? I don't mean just drug addiction. I don't mean, you know, someone who's lost in the just love of the world. Do you know anybody? And we had this question on Friday for our uh, Bible study, and many people say, I have plenty of people that I used to go to church with, and they are long gone. They haven't been walking with the Lord for so long. So what are you doing about that? Okay, Christianity is about saving and delivering a person who's dying and lost. Okay, so that is an introduction. I want to go into the topic, and now we're in the last chapter of this magnificent gospel of Galatians. Made up of six chapters, we spent about seven months, and we're kind of finishing up for those of you who are joining. Um, you could always go to our website and lis listen to all of them, okay? And I really encourage you to do that. I really encourage you to understand the gospel. As we finish up, I've been introducing two pillars of not only the Galatians gospel, but Christianity. One is salvation is by God and grace alone. It's God's religion. That's John Stott's term. It's not what you do. It's not what you can do or will do. It's what God has done already through Jesus Christ. And we call justification by faith or salvation by faith alone god's religion the other pillar is so you become a christian then how do you live this life for the rest of your life live by holy spirit holy spirit is god who lives and dwells in you no i want i want to just pause i don't want to just spit out words but he actually dwells in you. He lives, in, he lives in, with you and in you. John chapter 16. And I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you, and you don't have to say amen if, uh, if you are not sure about that, but how many of you live with the Holy Spirit and leading your life? Would you say amen? There are people. They are kind of like timid. I'm going to ask one more time, okay? If you're living and led by the Spirit, would you say amen? And I really mean it, okay? That's what the Christian gospel is. That's what Christianity is. It's not a religion. It's not something you do try, become, do better, do more. No, no. It, it encompasses your entire being, entire life, entire history. Okay? Two pillars. Justification by faith and sanctification by Holy Spirit. You, be, you are saved by God's grace and you live with God's Spirit. Okay? Last week, we dealt, 
and saw the life uh, or the life, the lives of one who is living in the flesh without faith and those who are living in the spirit, Christians, saved. And it was a very vivid picture. It was characterized by four categories, and it started with sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. The sexual sin. It's the most external, obvious sin. Look at the world. Look at the culture. Some people say our Western culture is compatible to Roman culture. Okay, Roman culture was a sewage, actually. It was horrible. And we are chasing after that. You sense that, right? You sense that. It's followed by, and then followed by idolatry. What is idolatry? Thou shalt not have no other God before me. It's the first commandment. It's what God hates the most. Living in idolatry, you treasure, you worship something or someone other than God. Does that make any sense? So sexual immorality, idolatry, and then followed by very difficult to relate person, envious, divisional, always undermining uh, the unity, right? Jealousy, and then followed by, lastly, just alcohol and drunkenness, okay? Picture that. And uh, life that is living in the spirit is very, very different than that, okay? Love, joy, and peace primarily toward God. You love God, and God brings joy in your heart. And you have peace with God. Do you have peace with God? If you don't have peace with God, I can't imagine you could have peace with anyone, including yourself. Do you love and content and thankful about yourself? Or do you feel, why was I born like this? You know, it's the love, joy, peace that God brings to your soul through the person of Holy Spirit. Okay? The second triad is uh, long-suffering or patience, kindness, and goodness. It has to do with relationship with others. Are you patient with your wife? Are you patient with your husband? Are you patient with your daughter? Are you patient with your sister? Are you kind and goodness? Your general heart toward others is good or is it envious? Or just you want to be on top of him, proud. Holy Spirit, right? And then the last triad is, of course, faithfulness, gentleness, that's what we're going to be talking about, and self-control. And that has to do with your, your quality. Are you a faithful person? Do people consider, would you... Would people consider you as a faithful person? Let me give you an illustration. I've been faithful to my wife for three days. That sounds really bad, does it? doesn't it? I've been faithful to my wife for three weeks. That sounds horrible. Faithfulness insinuates the duration. Someone who is consistent and reliable. Someone who could trust. That's the fruit of Holy Spirit. And then gentleness that we're going to be talking about. And then there is a self-control. Are you very possessive and addictive? Idolatrous? Opposite of self-control. It's kind of interesting, as observation, that gentleness sits between faithfulness and self-control. Very difficult to be gentle without these two qualities. And this is the kind of picture or sketch of a person who is living with the person of Holy Spirit, fruit of Holy Spirit, okay? We draw that last week, and I want to just kind of give you who is Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not mystical power. Holy Spirit is a person of God, third person of our triune God of the Bible, creator of of the universe and he lives in you dwells in you that's christian gospel okay and uh second thing is he indwelling of the holy spirit holy spirit actually lives in you you are in the spirit 
and spirit is in you. You may be thinking, what is he talking about? But that's the spiritual reality. You are in the spirit and spirit is in you. Okay? And it's leading your life, not on Sundays and retreats, but every single day. Lord, should I take this job? Lord, should I yell at her? Lord, should I marry him? Holy Spirit leading your life step by step. Guaranteeing, the Bible, Bible's word is, he, Holy Spirit guarantees, guarantees in Ephesians that he will lead and finish the race for your life. Holy Spirit is the guarantee. God's guarantee. Okay? Thirdly, Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. He does not leave you in a mess, in drunkenness, sexually moral, but he cleanses you. Ezekiel chapter 36. He changes your life. God really changes your life. And because God has given already to a Christian a new heart. Okay? New Heart Mission Church comes from that. Ezekiel 36 verse 26. He literally gives you a new heart toward new affection. You have new affection. Something you could not love, now you love. Something you could not understand, you began to understand. Something you could not see, you began to see. Uh, this week, I'm um, doing this uh, baptism class with this couple. I will not specify who they are. But, uh, you know, I'm doing this study, and I asked them, so what kind of changes have you seen in your life? And she was sharing something that really, really touched my heart. She said, you know, when I first came to church, maybe like a year and a half ago, I did not understand the thing you were saying, pastor was saying. Maybe some of you are there right now. I did not understand the thing. It's not because she's an illiterate and, and dumb person, but she just could not understand. So she had this desire, and so she prayed, actually prayed, Lord, help me to understand God's word. Lord, teach me and help me to really get God's word. And he's, then she starts reading it slowly. And then one day, sitting in a pew where you're sitting right now, and then the Pastor Paul changes preaching style. It's become so easy to understand. So after the service, she asks a sister, did Pastor Paul change his preaching style today? And she said, no, he didn't. But do you hear the difference? What was impossible to understand, now you could understand. You begin to understand. You desire to understand. New affection. So I was just listening to that, and I was rejoicing. And he, someone who's going to marry her, said, same thing, same thing that happened to me. Now I, begin, I, I desire to hear it more. I can't wait until I could hear it. New affection. And then the verse that came to my mind was, what is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. You have to be born of God through the spirit of God. Then your heart changes, your spirit changes, your bent changes, and your desire changes, and your outlook on life changes. Everything changes. That's Christianity, people. If that's not happening, you must Test your and examine yourself, which we're going to have to talk about next week. The Bible continues you to continue to exhort you. Examine yourself to see if you're standing in the faith. Test yourself. Check your work. Check your fruits. Okay, so we pick up <clears throat> from there, last verse of chapter 5, uh, leading into chapter 6. Now, what is that life in the spirit as a Christian look like? And we want to talk about just two things, okay, but it'll take two weeks. The first thing is what we're going to talk about, restoring a brother in a spirit of gentleness. Second thing we're going to talk about in two weeks is bearing one another's burdens, okay? But today we're just going to deal with the first one. So here's a quote by Philip Riken, who came to our ambassador's conference a couple years ago. He's the president of Witten College, and he used to be the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church uh, in Philadelphia. Great man of God. Listen to this. The life of the Spirit, or Christian life, 
flourishes for sake of others. It is not experienced in private primarily, but exercised in public. Therefore, it does not grow in isolation, but within the community of faith. Spiritual life is meant to be shared. I don't know whether you see it. If you look at today's text, if we live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit, let us not become one another, provoking one another, envying one another, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, who are walking in the Spirit, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted, and bear one another's burden. I don't know whether you're hearing it, okay? I'm kind of making it obvious, but Christian life is meant to be exercised in the community of faith. One another, one another. One another. If I just do it and you don't respond to it, that's not one another. But if you look at the scripture, scripture continues to talk about one another. In other words, when you become a Christian, you are united with Christ and you are united with his body, the church. That's what it means to be a Christian. It cannot be exercised in private alone. And he's basically saying, when you bear the fruits, who's going to enjoy it? Other people. If I bear the fruit of, let's say, long-suffering, who's going to be most benefited? Probably my wife. Probably my children. Someone who's close to me. When I bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit, people close to me will be benefited, and they're going to enjoy it, right? So a life of spirit flourishes for the sake of others. It is not experienced in private it's not meant to be lived live like that. When you are united with Christ, who's the head of the church, you're also united with other Christians. That's what it means to be a Christian. One another. Love one another. Serve one another. Encourage one another. Bear burdens of one another. Do not provoke one another. Do not envious of one another. Do you hear it? That's what it means to live as a Christian. Apart from it, you really cannot live a Christian life nor grow as a Christian. You don't grow. Okay? So, therefore, it does not grow in isolation, but within the community of faith, which is what church's spiritual life is meant to be shared. Can I share something? You know, the nature of sin, you want to be isolated. You know anybody who wants want to be just isolated? in his room all by himself, playing game like 14 hours a day, in darkness, isolated. There are people like that. I've seen people like that. That's not grace. That's not Christian grace. That's usually the fruit of sin. Do you remember in uh, Genesis chapter 3, when sin came into the world, Adam and Eve, what's the first thing they did? They hide themselves, hide themselves, separated. They want to be isolated. They want to hide. When I do uh, premarital counseling, you know, one of the things about marriage is marriage needs to be a place that is safe. Safe means if I expose myself, if I expose everything about myself, will my wife accept me and still love me? Right? And the assumption is that when we get married, of course, we, we, that's what, what it means to love, especially with the love of Christ. But we don't. That's why we can reveal ourselves. We cannot open ourselves. And we have to hide. We have to kind of like, like pretend. We have to kind of like be a hypocrite. That's why marriage stings and it's broken. Right? That's what sin does. But grace is just the opposite. And love is just the opposite. Love wants to be united. Love wants to cover. Love wants to be joined together. It goes back to the original meaning of what it means to be a human. Because our God is always in community. God is always us. He is triune God. 
Father God, Son, God, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was always exist as, uh, as a community. And we are created in the image of God, which means we are created to be in community. Right? One another. Join together. But sin separates you. Sin one, you know, makes you want to be isolated. Okay? So, Christian life is meant to be shared. And life is be meant to be shared. So you need to come to Christ for, so that you'll be able to open yourself and feeling secure because of Christ. And you can love one another. So let's go into today's topic, when you are walking in the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit. And we see that in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, the thing that we want to talk about is we begin to restore another brother who are caught in, in, in transgression. Okay? So let's talk about that. What kind of sin? Well, probably the best example in the Bible is sexual sin. Okay, I don't try to corner you or anything like that, but that's prevalent. Sexual sin is probably the most obvious external sin that shows up as a, a, as a product of sin. And the, uh, the whole world and the culture is full of sexual sin. Now, but the expression is very, very interesting. If anyone is, verse 6, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, can I just ask you, have you ever got caught doing something bad? You never got caught? You never got caught stealing something? You never got caught cheating? You never got caught, I don't know, put your finger in someone else's water? And nothing like that? You never got caught? I did. I did. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to explain. But when I hear the word caught, it reminds me of a story which is really, really famous in John chapter 8, a woman who was caught, listen to this, at the act of adultery. Now, picture this. This woman was actually in a bed with someone and got caught. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the shame? Can you imagine shock? Can you imagine the fear? And that's what we see in John chapter 8. And I, I love this story. Okay? John chapter 8, a woman was caught at the act of adultery, which is sexual sin. The Bible speaks about that in 1 Corinthians. There is a, I guess, a member or a deacon who was sleeping with his, uh, his father's wife, stepmother. And it speaks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So what happened in John chapter 8 was a woman was caught, and the Pharisees and scribes who were trying to set up a trap for Jesus, that was their purpose, but they brought this woman to Jesus. But let me just give you the background. John chapter 8 is in Jerusalem, right in front of Jerusalem Temple. Can you picture that? Those of you who never been to Jerusalem, it's hard to picture, but it's a magnificent building. It's so big. In first century in Jesus' time, temple represented where God is. That's where God is. Okay? And Jesus was in Jerusalem Early in the morning, picture that, five in the morning, teaching the crowd. And this woman was brought by scribes and, and Pharisees. Can you imagine the commotion? Yeah. Yelling, I don't know. All of a sudden, in the, early in the morning, in front of the temple, she was brought before Jesus. And they basically asked, accusing this woman, and basically said, you know, the law of Moses said, woman who was caught at the act of adultery must be stoned to death. In other words, we need to kill her right now. That's what she deserves. And that's according to the law of God. What were they demanding? They were demanding justice. Justice. What is the right thing to do? Can you picture that? She was caught at the act of adultery. Do you know how Jesus responded? Something you would never guess. He already, all of a sudden, he bent his back, stooped down, and began to write something underground. Can you picture that? You were yelling at me, 
but I just kind of totally ignore you, and I bent down, start writing something on the ground. What was Jesus doing? We don't know. We could speculate, but we really don't know. That's the answer. They began to scream more. Come on, Jesus. Come on. She was caught in the act of adultery. According to the law, she needs to be stoned to death right now. They were demanding justice. They were yelling at Jesus. <laughs> Jesus writing something on the ground, and she, he just kind of gets up and basically look at them and said, He who, who is without sin, let him be the first one to throw a stone at her. If you don't have any sin, you punish her first. You throw your rock at her first. And then he stoops down and begins to write on the ground again. WWJD, pretty amazing. That's what Jesus did. And guess what happened? One by one, starting from the old one, they just walk away. The Word of God has the authority. Word of God is a Word of the living God. That's why it has the authority. And basically, said when he said, is anybody, he who has no sin, let him be the first one throw a rock at her. They must have pricked their conscience, and they began to feel guilty. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Maybe Jesus just kind of zip with the power. I don't know. I don't know what happened. And then they began to walk away one by one. Can you imagine early in the morning, after that commotion, everyone left in front of Jerusalem temple, this woman on the ground, probably hair all over the place. I don't even know what she was wearing, the clothing. I don't know. She was caught. I don't know whether she, they give her time to put the clothes back on. I don't know. And she was brought here, shocked probably, so ashamed. Standing alone with a person who has no sin, who has right to throw rock at her. Because he's holy God. Can you picture that? And the thought is, you know, you're going to be caught at the end when you stand before God. Every single one of you. Me too. You're going to be caught. Absolutely you're going to be caught. Every single sin, you will be caught. And you will stand alone before the holiness of God who has a right to to punish you and condemn you and throw rock at you. That's Christianity. That's the reality, people. Without that, you don't believe in Jesus. You don't believe in a Savior. You don't believe in Christianity, right? It's all religion for your betterment of your life and on this side of eternity. So can you picture that? He's standing, and then she was probably on the, uh, on the floor, probably didn't even lift her head, head up, right? And then finally, Jesus opens his mouth. Woman. That's like, Madame. He treats her with such dignity. Madame, woman. Where are they? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She probably felt something. It was quiet, right, after the commotion. And she probably finally lift her heads up, look around, and realizing there is nobody around. And Jesus is dealing with this woman with such gentleness. Don't you see it? Right? And she lift up her heads and realizing there is no one's there. And she answers, Lord, there's no one here. No one is condemning me. In fact, the truth of the matter is, no one can condemn me. Do you realize that? Before the holiness of God, you will never be able to con condemn anybody because you do the same. You who are judging are doing the same thing. And you will be caught, right? So when she said, you know, oh, no one, no one here, and then Jesus says, uh, said something unthinkable. Love this. And then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go sin no more. 
which is incredible, but can I just ask you, is that okay? Can he, can he do that? What I mean by that is, someone was caught at the act of adultery, right? Horrible thing. Someone just killed, let's say, someone killed a child and or molested little little baby or little child. And a judge says, okay, neither do I condemn you, I'll let you go. Is that, is that okay? That's nice, but is that okay? It's not okay. Is that just? No, it's not just. It's unjust. So is God unjust then? Now, what about this part? Go sin no more. How do you do that? Is he just kind of saying, okay, don't do this anymore? Is that, is that what he's saying? I don't think so. Okay? Pretty incredible. And I want to deal with these two questions at the end. So Jesus forgave her and restored her. A woman who was caught at the act of adultery. And the Bible is saying those who of you have experience the grace of God and be saved and the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now you go, restore brothers with the spirit of that kind of gentleness. <laughs> What's gentleness? That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus talks about a restoring a brother, in fact, uh, you know, uh, what is known as church discipline. A lot of people uh, think this is such a terrible verse, but more I read about this, this is what Jesus taught the church, and that's the love of Christ. Listen to this, okay? If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. What do you hear? With such privacy and gentleness. You pray, and you go talk to your brother who are living in sin. Sexual sin, idolatry, you go tell him. Okay? If he listens to you, then you gain a brother. So in other words, the whole purpose of this whole ministry and life is to gain a brother, to save a brother. Not to hate or condemn or, or looking down on, on him, but to gain a brother, to save a brother. But I guess Jesus knew. But if he does not listen, a lot of times people don't listen, okay? If he does not listen, take one or two others with you, along with you, other brothers with you, and you tell them again so that every charge may be established by the witness of two or three witnesses. Someone is, let's say, living with uh, his stepmom, like First Corinthians story. You go tell them. If he refuses to listen, you go with a couple other brothers prayerfully. Establish a, 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 an evidence and witnesses. And Jesus, I guess, knew better. Third time, if he still refuses to listen to them, go tell the church. In other words, now it's public. Now it's public. Okay? Wow, that's really nasty. That's really sad. Can you imagine someone is living in sexual sin and you tell the whole church, hey, blah, 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 he is living in sexual sin. This is what Jesus taught. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector, meaning he's not a believer, he's not a member of the church. Expel him, excommunicate him. You think, wow, that's not love. But this is what Jesus taught the church, who loves the church and who died for the church. The whole process of restoring a brother is not to expel the brother, but to restore the brother, to gain a brother. If someone is lost and someone is living in darkness, if you just leave him alone, what's going to happen to him? He's going to die. He will surely die, or he's been, he's been dead already. What's, well, then what, 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 what are we supposed to do? Basically, Jesus is telling who loves his church, who died for his church, you go tell him, speak to him, exhort him, pray for him. Okay? But this restoring of a brother is to be carried out in a very particular manner. And we see that in verse 1, okay, 6 1. 
if anyone is caught in the act of transgression, you who are spiritual, meaning you are a Christian walking, living in the spirit, should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. You don't condemn him, but spirit of gentleness. And second thing is keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted, which means look at yourself. Look at yourself and make sure you are in the right heart and right spirit. Let me explain, okay? First of all, spirit of gentleness. That's, not, that's just more than you, your trying or effort to be gentle. Okay, that's not what it means. The gentleness, as we talked about it, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Meaning, when you live and abide in Christ, when the Spirit of Christ lives in you, it becomes your fruit. It becomes your fruit. And the insight that, I thought, uh, that came to my mind was this afternoon was, is sitting between faithfulness and self-control. If you're walking and living in the Spirit, you will have self-control. You are not crazy about, addicted about something, and idolatrous. Self-control and faithful. As you are reminded of God's loving kindness, which means His mercy and His forgiveness towards you. The truth of the matter is that woman who was caught at the act of, act of adultery is me and it's you. Are you better? You just want caught, but you will be caught. Guarantee you'll be caught. Guarantee you'll be caught. Every sexual thing, every theft, every murder, you'll be caught. Guarantee. Because God is all-knowing God. The Bible speaks about that. And as you look at yourself, you're reminded of His kindness. Yes, that's me. But He has shown such great mercy to me. And I ask you this question, have you ever got caught and experienced forgiveness? I have, actually. I have. And I remember when I was experienced that forgiveness, I don't know, I was ready to forgive anybody for anything. My heart was so humbled and tender. Wow, I'm such a, I'm such a jerk. And God has shown great mercy to me. I'm ready to forgive anybody. You are not condemning. You are not judging. You are not envying. You are, one, you are not always trying to like oppress him. No. You, are, you become gentle. You become lowly in heart. Okay? Jesus said, come to me, all you weary and heavy burden. I'm going to give you rest and take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am humble and gentle. Can you believe our God is humble and gentle? And if you walk with him, what would, you ha what would happen to you? You will become humble and gentle. Right. Secondly, keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted. In other words, the word keep watch means uh, scope, which means give attention to, to contemplate on yourself. You know who does that? Holy Spirit in you does that. Without the Holy Spirit, if you're just a religious person, you're always looking at other people, other people's fault. Why is he dressing up with suit? Like, you know, we're always like judging others, complaining about others. Look at her, look at him. What a jerk. Can you believe that? The Holy Spirit, if he lives in you, he convicts about your sin and your righteousness and your judgment. The Bible says in John chapter 16, what does that mean? He helped you to see as a counselor, as a mother, as a parent, Paul, you shouldn't be so rigid with your wife. You should help her. You should be kind to her. You shouldn't be so demanding to your child. Do you know what I mean? Holy Spirit speaks to me and convicts me, right? So he helped me to see my sin and began to see my righteousness and there is no righteousness in me. My righteousness is unrighteousness. So what do I do? Man, I'm ruined. 
Just like Romans chapter 7. You know, remember, I desire to do in my in, inmost being. I really want to live for Him. I want to, I want to be re- really a good person. I, I have that desire because God gave me a new heart. But there is another law or power in me, flesh, and, and that's capturing me to disobedience. And I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I need to do, what I want to do. Oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who can rescue me? Who could say something like this? Someone who has the Spirit. Help you see who you are. Or else you always look at other people and judging, complaining, condescending. So all I see is my unrighteousness. So my only righteousness is looking to the cross who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Christian life, people. Okay? Holy Spirit convicts about your sin and righteousness and judgment. Judgment. So Spirit of God gives you humbleness, lowly in heart. Okay? It's not something you try. It's something that is revealed. You cannot help but to be humble because you are Someone who's like that woman in in John chapter 8 who has been forgiven. That's why you will be humble. You will be gentle. Therefore, I go to my brother, relying upon the Spirit's work in gentleness, knowing that I am well capable of falling into the same sin and transgression that he is in right now. I'm, I'm so capable of that. In fact, I could easily be that unless God pours grace upon me and walks with me. You have that kind of heart. So the spirit, life of, in the spirit of the gospel, do not condemn your brother, nor condescendingly judging, looking down, but you seek mercy upon him, not justice. You seek restoration of him, not cancellation. Do you hear me, people? We are living in a canceling culture rather than restoring someone, a brother who is in, living in sin culture. I want to just close. Uh, Christianity is about seeking to save and restore someone who was lost. Do you know anybody? Can I just ask you? We had this question last Friday. Do you know anybody in your life who used to be in the Lord but now living in complete darkness? Do you know anybody? You probably do. And I pray that the Spirit will remind you, recall that person. Okay? It is about that fallen, lost brother or sister and Jesus like a good shepherd leaving the 99 behind, go after that one lost sheep to restore and bring that sheep home. Do you realize in the Bible, the Bible never says a goat just turned into a sheep. It never says that. It's a lost sheep came home. Do you hear me? I hope you hear this. The Bible never really says, you know, uh, you know, someone who is a goat just became a sheep. It's the lost son coming home. It's the lost sheep coming home. That's restoration and salvation. God has shown grace upon you already. And uh, to restore, to bring home is the Christian gospel. And for this purpose, God, Yahweh, came to us into history. And we talked about this. He actually came to us and into history. That Yahweh God, His name is Jesus. He did not treat the woman in John chapter 8 who was caught at the act of adultery according to what she rightly, justly deserved. And He was the only person who could have picked up a stone and condemn and punish and judge her. And yet, woman, with such dignity, woman, where are they? Has no one condemn you 
And then he shares unthinkable. Neither do I condemn you. For Bible says in John chapter 3, Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Okay? But that question, how can he possibly do that? Is that a right thing to do? Can he pardon a wicked sinner just pardoning, okay, I'll let you go. That's not right. That is wrong. That is unjust. Unjust. Right? How can he possibly tell him, go sin no more? Let's, let's deal with those two questions, okay? First of all, how can, pos- how can Jesus possibly forgive such a woman justly? And you know what? Abs- he, our God is absolute God of justice. Perfect justice. A woman cut so shameful way, fearful way, based on the law of God. In other words, the law, law and the justice demands her to be stoned to death. That's absolute justice. That is the right thing to do. But Jesus bring justice through the cross. That's the cross. What do you mean by that? Jesus took on her sin upon himself. And he received the stoning from God on the cross. He received the wrath and judgment and rocks thrown at him for her. And he died for her. Pay the penalty. Absolute just righteousness has been demonstrated. Okay? At the same time, because he has done, he has a right to forgive her. He has absolute right to forgive her because her penalty, her sin, has been put upon him because he was sinless. No one else could do that. You cannot die for anyone else. That's not going to work. You need to die for your sin forever. Forever, people. Your sin will be caught. Absolutely. You may get away, uh, get away with me, but you're not going to get away with him. You're not. the cross. Jesus demonstrated God's perfect justice. At the same time, Jesus, who is sinless, took on the, that adultery of that woman and the sin of that woman upon himself, and by paying for that sin, he justified her. So Romans 3.26 says, God is just and the justifier. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ of the cross. It's the cross, people. It's the cross. It's God's religion. It's God's grace. It's your life and your heart unreservedly being united with Him. Placing your life upon Him. You can't play the game with Him. You can't, people. Does that give you peace when you play game with him? You will never have peace. You continue to just play the game. Everyone else is doing it. But you're going to be standing alone, though. You'll be standing alone in the presence of God. Absolutely. And you will be caught. Second and last question, how can he possibly tell her to live a life apart from sin. You know what? It's because God gives a right to become a child of God when she places her faith in Jesus. And when she becomes a child of God, Spirit lives in her, in you. That's why you have, you have overcome the power of sin and you could be victorious life. It is about the Galatians gospel, isn't it? Salvation by grace and grace alone through the cross of Lord Jesus Christ and the life and sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit and who dwells in you forever. That's what the Christian gospel is. If you put your faith in him and him alone. My brothers and sisters, that's the power of the cross. He demonstrated his justice and he is the justifier of the woman who was caught at the act of adultery. And that's you and I. 
Would you come to him? Because you will stand alone before him in the presence of living God. Let's pray. You got to stop saying things like everyone else is doing it. 